Well, I guess I'll ask this. Like, out of all the books in the Bible, let's take that as an example. Um, like, what, what has spoken to you the most, maybe as of late or in maybe over the course of doing the, the research that you've done over the past year or however long it's been? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, my answer stays the same as when we first talked. It's, it's the book of Job by far. Um, yeah. it's yeah. Yeah. Book of Job. <laughs> yeah. And I knew we were going to talk about this because, um, your last video, uh, just it's, it's, like, it's like Young's, um, work surrounding the book of Job, right? Answer to Job. Uh -huh. Answer to Job. Right. Um, and we, that's what we talked about. That was like the main thing we talked about last time, I think. We talked about Christ just like we did just now, but also the book of Job. And I think that to me is also one of the most interesting books in the Bible, at least in the Old Testament. Um, and I think anyone, even if you're not really religious, I think you can kind of relate with that feeling of everything is going wrong and I haven't done anything wrong. And there's a sense of futility and like, I mean, obviously Job is able to actually speak directly with God, which I think many of us would, I don't have any experience of as far as I know, but you know, it's obviously meant to be a story, but it's meant to like convey a certain idea to those that are reading it. Um, so I'll ask you like, what, what about the book of Job speaks to you the most? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So I guess just to start it out, um, you know, I'll give kind of like a brief summary of it for, for anybody that maybe hasn't, um, read the book, but, um, so Job was apparently, the story opens with Job being the most sort of blameless, upright man of all the earth, right? And so he's, he's wealthy, he has lots of flocks of sheep, he has lots of children, etc. Um, so then it kind of cuts to um, a scene of the heavenly court, right? And um, uh, Satan or Hasatan, which is like just, it, it means an accuser or a foe. It doesn't mean, you know, capital S Satan as we understand right. it. Can I just um, sort say of, that, like, that Satan is like a concept that wasn't really like a thing in the Old Testament, really? Yeah, it, it, it really wasn't. It, yeah. it wasn't at all. And and when Satan is used in, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, um, it's it's really just like an accuser of the court. Okay. almost like a, like, a, um, a prosecutor, um, oh, okay. is really the best way to look at it. Not, you know, angry red guy, Satan. <laughs> right. Right. In the depths of hell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's, and that's a really important piece of context that we don't often have. Right. right. Um, so I, I, I think, yeah, I like to highlight that because it's, it's important, mm -hmm. um, in, in translation to me. And so, Okay. Um, this, this Hasatan puts a bug in God's ear. That's basically like, well, you know, take a look at Job. He's so righteous, whatever. But if you, you know, um, started to destroy the things around him, he would curse you. And so, um, God gives Hasatan permission, um, to do whatever to Job without hurting him. And so basically, um, at the end of this, uh, all of Job's children are killed. Um, his God. house falls in. He loses all of his wealth. Um, his wife hates him. And then he's he's left with, you know, after after that happens, Hasatan goes back to God and says, well, look, you know, look at all this stuff and, and Job still hasn't cursed you. I bet if I actually touch him and hurt him, he'll curse you. Um, so then Job ends up covered in sores and boils and on the verge of death and job still continues not to curse god but at that point he is so miserable that he he basically shouts out that he demands um for his case to be heard by god um which is really interesting and it's not unique that story is not unique it's seen a couple times but he demands his case to be seen in like a courtroom sense by god because he he is convinced of his innocence and that he didn't deserve these things to befall him. Right. Yeah. So then, um, he receives all this like bizarre advice from, um, his friends and, um, they kind of represent these different takes on, you know, well, you, um, you just receive what, what you get, you know, you, you were worthy of, of these terrible things for some reason you did something wrong, et cetera. 
Um, so they give a bunch of bad advice to him. And Job still says, no, I don't care. You're miserable comforters. I, I still want my case to be heard. Mm -hmm. So um, God finally agrees to uh, answer Job. Um, and God responds from a thundering whirlwind and offers these lengthy monologues based around all these nature-oriented questions directed at Job and these cosmic questions um, that are like, you know, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Things like that. Um, obviously that Job cannot answer, right? And it really puts him in his place. Um, and then uh, God also asks him questions about Le Leviathan and Behemoth um, as, you know, these are my playmates. Could you put a fish hook through their nose? Could you, you know, could you master them basically? And of course, Job is like, no, I have nothing. I have nothing to say. I cannot respond. Um, and so that was essentially satisfactory um, for God. And so at the end of that, because Job never cursed God, um, God restores, you know, his wealth, his health, and uh, bestows more children upon him. So that's basically like, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> this, a, a, I guess a brief summary of, <laughs> of the yeah, book. Um, right. And so, you know, th this book has captivated the imagination of so many people. There's so many interpretations of Job out there. Um, and so I, I recently finished a book um, called On Job by Gustavo Gutierrez. And it was like, it was the most positive interpretation that I've seen um, of the book of Job. And so I really liked that because he, he brings in this image of God as sort of like this, like sarcastic, witty, um sort of um the, the term is around like bohemian god like slipping by you know kind of like joking and ribbing almost and and um and he really highlights that these these nature oriented questions are not to like crush job into the ground um but are more so to show job this sort of like large cosmic picture that is basically to show him that, you know, the world is built upon this idea of gratuitous freedom and love, um, rather than like, like fear and like punishment, right, that you would see in most interpretations of Job. Um, but it, G Gutierrez's interpretation also stresses um, that the monologues are so nature oriented, um, that it really shows that, you know, we are not living in an anthropocentric universe, mm -hmm. that, you know, wild animals are just as important as human beings are, um, that behemoth and Leviathan are playmates of God, that God appreciates them. Um, and, and human beings are not mentioned in those, those questions that God asks, um, nor is Job's condition mentioned at all by God. And so I think that really puts this major perspective into how God is responding to Job. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I, I thought that was, that was such a beautiful interpretation um, of the, the book of Job that I have not yeah. seen. Right. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I think that there's a relatability to Job's plight. Obviously everything he's going through is extreme, but I, I could say, when I've ever gone through bouts of like deep depression, <clears throat> deep depression, or when things are just shitty and things are falling apart, relationships aren't working, you know, inner turmoils, like all the things that happen. And, ob and obviously there's people that experience way worse and they're, you know, going through incredible turmoil. And there's always this point in that we're like, what is the purpose of all of this? And I don't know if that's, that seems like a pretty universal question or experience that people have, but to have God come down and literally say, were you around when I made all this? Like, do you understand any of this that's happening? Like your, your experience is almost, it's very self, to me, how I interpret it when you're saying all that, it's like, you're looking at it through a very limited perception and that uh i don't know there i'm not sure like like god doesn't really even seem to provide a there's no solution there's no actual to me it doesn't always feel like there's no closure even it's just like this is what it is and i am god but like 
okay. Like, I don't know. It, it, to me, I always felt like Job got kind of, like, I guess my original interpretation of it is that God, got, God was being kind of a, a, an asshole because I'm like, dude, like, you did all this stuff to him because this is all, like, this is what you're doing. Like, you and, and this accuser made a deal had like a little bet going on and this guy was just kind of like doing his thing just vibing down on earth with his family you know and he's just fine he's fine he's not doing anything wrong and all of it was just a way for the so-called devil or the accuser to make a point uh and god too i guess and to me i always interpreted that in like a negative light because i'm like i don't want to be the plaything of this omnipotent being like you know what i mean Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, Jung in answer to Job has, has a similar, lots of similar thoughts on, on it as well. Um, of that, you know, these monologues that, that God has is actually absolutely just crushing this human worm into the ground. You know, that there's, there's no fair fight, you know, it's, it's not an even match at all. It's just, God showing this absolute power to crush this man. Um, and so that's, that's a valid interpretation of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Jung makes the point that um, at this time, you know, um, Job is, is morally superior because he's completely innocent. Mm-hmm. Um, and so because of that, and, and once God finally realizes um, that he was not, he wasn't in touch with his omnipotence um, as he was um, essentially punishing Job. And once God comes to this realization, it changes the trajectory of human history and puts God on a trajectory towards the incarnation, which would be Jesus the Christ. Um, and so I think that's incredibly interesting as well, that, that this point is almost like, um, in Jung's interpretation, God going, oh, I made a mistake. I wasn't in touch with my omnipotence. I'm going to completely shift the trajectory of human history now because this man was morally superior to me in his innocence. Which uh, is like, what? <laughs> okay, so so is that the idea then that God is this like evolving thing? Like an entity that is like evolving his or their own morality and sense of like purpose almost like, cause that, cause again, uh, how I've always interpreted it and how it was always presented to me growing up in Sunday school and all this stuff is like, God is always correct. God has always been the same throughout time. But one of the things that got me to question the entire, my whole religious experience was actually when I got into high school and we started to study each of the Old Testament uh, scriptures, the books individually, and started to go through them. And I realized that God is so weird and different in these older texts than he is in the New Testament. And they're telling me this is the same God, and I could not understand that. And because they would say that this is the same God, he's always been this way, this is all a part of a grand plan, and and I just couldn't buy that. And I, I think I would have been much more interested in accepting of my religious uh, teachings, if there was an acknowledgement of God being a evolving thing, you know? Yeah, no, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it makes sense that that would be the case. Um, so there's a school of theology called process theology. Um, and that is, is it just like process philosophy, which, you know, we, we're, constantly changing or evolving and we have to take that into consideration with anything right um process theology is that god is eternally in process it's an evolutionary process and we're tied to it just as we evolve and continue through history so does god as well um and so this allows for um humanity for the universe whatever to have an effect on the divine um, and so therefore that would make sense when it comes to, um, this interaction with Job changing the trajectory of human history. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, I, I really think about that having an effect on the divine, like with eco theology as well, which is basically, um, taking a theological look at, um, the interconnectedness of life, of climate change, of our ecological systems, 
how we are actually impacting the earth relates directly to the divine and the sacredness of earth as well. And so I, it really sits well with me to think about it in this sense, because, you know, I mean, I grew up with the assumption that that God is, you know, immovable and passable. Um, the Stoics had this idea of apatheia and they wanted to apply it to, you know, transcendent God as well. Um, and it, it, it's like, it makes sense to me in a sense, but it doesn't explain everything. I have to, and, and now at this point, you know, I have to understand God as, as in process. And of course, you know, we can't always think of time as linear time. So some aspect of God might remain the same, but God is also malleable and, and able to evolve, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, that's, that's how I'm, the understanding that I'm working with now. Um, and yeah, it, it makes sense for me for a lot of different applications.